It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom. It was the age of foolishness. It was the epoch of belief. It was the epoch of incredulity. It was the season of light. It was the season of darkness. It was the spring of hope. It was the winter of despair. These words were written in 1859 by Dickens, and they still ring true today as we live through a once in a lifetime event of a global pandemic that has in turn challenged our social safety nets, the way we conduct our social and personal lives, the economy, and so on. And yet, we have the foolishness and perhaps the audacity to anticipate the future, a better future. So what is the future? How do we get there? Who lives there? And what is it about the future that matters the most? Imagining the future is just another form of memory, says this article in The Atlantic. Our ability to predict the future is all thanks to our ability to remember the past. Therefore, to start with the not so great part, having to think about the future then leaves us challenged in several ways. First, that we are necessarily limited by our ability to imagine the future because all our predictions rely on what we already know. A study reflected here on the neuroscience of thinking about the future done by Joseph Cable and his colleagues at the University of the Pennsylvania finds that most of us rely on our ability to make plans for the future based on what we can imagine. So for instance, in 2020, when I started my real job, I could not have imagined how life would turn out just a few months later. Our extensive public health protocols, all schooling and work going virtual, the lockdowns. But now, having lived through it, it is much more easier for me to imagine this reality. So, asked Joseph Cable and his colleagues, where do these limits on our capacity to imagine come from? Second, we suffer from something called the optimism bias. We humans are hardwired to think that tomorrow will necessarily be better than today. While this optimism has allowed us to make progress by giving us the ability to imagine alternate futures that truly are better, we perhaps might benefit from tempering our expectations. To know that the future holds more surprises and potentially more disappointments than we might predict. Further, fear, doubt, lack of urgency, apathy, all of these create barriers for us, making us unable but also unwilling to imagine the future. The psychologist Melanie Klein talks about the moral nature of certain predictions about the future, which then tends to evoke, and I quote, a refusal to believe what at the same time one knows to be true, and expresses the universal tendency towards denial, with denial being a potent defense against persecutory anxiety and guilt. But I have some good news too. We can become better at imagining the future. This is a skill that can be learned, and it is called futures literacy. Propounded by Real Miller of UNESCO, Miller says that a futures literate person has acquired the skills needed to decide why and how to use their imagination to introduce the non-existent future into the present. So this is how a futures literate person, let's call her Sherab, would process a situation or an issue. First, Shara becomes aware of how the future plays a central role in what she perceives and pays attention to in the present. Shara then starts to realize that she can anticipate in many different ways 
and thereby imagine different futures. Imagining these different futures then changes what Sharap could see and do in the present. She then becomes aware of her own capacity to invent the underlying anticipatory assumptions about the future. She also begins to root these assumptions in her own history, socioeconomic and cultural context. Sharab then begins to reassess her perceptions of the present, the past and aspirations for the future. <coughs> Anticipating the future determines our actions and feelings that in turn play a role in what happens next. So Miller, again, says that developing this capacity to imagine can be a powerful tool for catalyzing change today. Becoming more skilled at designing systems and processes used to imagine tomorrow is essential to empower men and women with the capacity to be free, to craft new approaches to more inclusive and sustainable development. So let's apply all this to the developmental trajectory of our own country that I analyze through the lenses of ecology, innovation, and the future of youth. <clears throat> to speak of our country's environmental priorities, Bhutan's second submission to the nationally determined contribution to the Paris Agreement reaffirms the country's commitment to perpetually remain carbon neutral. This is further reinforced by our low emissions development strategies, the LEDs, and our upcoming NAP, the National Adaptation Plan. So the kind of future that this depicts then, and the one that we like to depict of Bhutan to the larger world, is one of Bhutan that is pristine and clean, and where people are ecologically and environmentally conscious. However, I am concerned that for the average Bhutanese, and especially for the average Bhutanese youth, climate change and subsequently climate action would appear to be a far away and abstract phenomenon, abstract phenomenon in the faces of the challenges that they face in their day to day. I'm talking about the economy, educational opportunities, employment prospects, and their overall physical and mental well-being in the context of the pandemic which has made the life choices and chances of many of our people appear all but grim. And in contrast, caring about the climate would appear to be way less urgent. So for me to imagine this alternate future where we are not being very much pro-environment would mean me asking, what are the eventualities that aren't so positive on a pro-environmental stance. Do we need to take an honest look and see how we may need to reconcile our developmental imperatives to our environmental ones? Where may we need to temper our ambitions then? To speak of innovation in the country, it is undeniable that technology is going to play a vital part in modernizing our public service delivery systems not only making them efficient, but also accountable. Yet the very socioeconomic divides that technology appears as a panacea to might only serve to widen this gap. And this gap exists not only between urban and rural folks or literate and illiterate folks. This gap exists in our very own organizations where ignorance supersedes novelty or worse, deliberate ignorance supersedes progress. So, to imagine this alternate future then would have me asking, who does the status quo serve today? And is that detrimental to the future that we want? And finally, to speak of the future of youth in Bhutan. Young people in Bhutan today make up the largest demographic section of our population. But as one Drug Journal article in its last issue on youth, their aspirations, concerns, and mandate points out, with the onus of the nation's future on our youth, what are the ground realities our young people are facing today? Are we in tune with their lived experiences and their aspirations? 
So the futures of our youth exist in the intersectionalities of education, wealth, sexuality, disability, and so on, that can either deeply disenfranchise them or enable them. And I would say, as a young person, that young people are already imagining the different futures that could exist for them. But are we, as policymakers and decision makers? So there is not one future, but futures that can exist based on the multiplicities of conditions that exist in the present and that may arise in the future. We must not pretend that we know what exactly is coming. We must recognize that the future is dynamic and a constantly evolving experiment in human living, just like the past and the present. And that we must necessarily be open to the several different ways of imagining the future. Futures literacy then enables the collective imagination and intelligence to bring the not yet in existence future into the present so that we can reassess and recalibrate our perceptions of the present and so that we may become better at depicting our aspirations for the future. For many years now, on the 17th of December, the entire nation arguably holds its breath for His Majesty the King's address. These addresses have been nothing short of a calling forth for us Bhutanese to be vested in the futures that can exist not only for the country, but also the world. But His Majesty this year lamented, I have serious concerns whether we have the will to fundamentally address some of the challenges that I've highlighted earlier. Several efforts have been made in the past to reform and improve our governance. However, we have yet to see tangible, meaningful improvements. So, are we then willing to see how our futures play a central role in what we perceive and pay attention to the present? That by imagining different futures and being open to that, very frankly, we must change what we can do in the present. Are we willing to reassess our perceptions of the present, our depictions of the past, and aspirations for the future? I thank you for your attention.